Well, uh, good morning and good afternoon, may I say, and welcome to a, another City Forum webinar done with FS Club in the City Forum 2023 Resilience Series. And today we're going to be talking about infrastructure. What can we do to make us disaster proof? And I'm delighted to have a huge number of guests here whom you all know and we'll be talking to in a moment. But before we begin, may I ask Mark Lee, um, chairman of City Forum, to make a few remarks. Mark, the floor is yours. Michael, I'm delighted that you're chairing this uh, webinar for us at the beginning of our next piece of work in the resilience area. It, it's always a, a, a delight to work with, with ZN and, and we're, we're looking forward to the discussion today. Uh, we have uh, three guests whom we've uh, had with us before, happily on many occasions in the shape of George Barnes, Deputy Director of NSA, who keynotes for us in our big autumn digital security event every winter. I'm really looking forward to having him back late in uh, this year. Christine Elliott, uh, who knows so much about professions in relation to the subject matter of the of, of the of the day and the, 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 the big organizations which have huge responsibilities. Christine, we're delighted to have you. And Elizabeth, it's uh, a, a particular pleasure to have you back again. You are the thunderer in the middle pages of the Times newspaper uh, today and, and uh, writing about uh, things which will surely come up this afternoon. We look forward to this uh, discussion and uh, hope that we shall have a a serious and useful occasion and develop some themes which we can look at later in the summer, the autumn and the coming winter. Michael, thank you again. Over to you. Wonderful. Well, thank you. Well, you'll all know me. I'm Michael Minelli. I'm one of the uh, directors of Zien, and it really is a privilege to be able to introduce some of these webinars. And we can really only do so uh, thanks to the tolerance and generosity of our many sponsors and our cooperation with City Forum. Uh, I myself have got a personal interest in this space, uh, not least because I believe that there's a, an enormous role for insurance and reinsurance to do much more in this, but it's going to require a lot of joined up thinking. Uh, and as I was saying in the warm up in the green room, as they like to call them these days, one of the things that bothers me is why is it that high impact, high probability risks such as the pandemic, which featured as high risk and high probability on just about every risk register that I've ever seen, uh, from the World Economic Forum to the British Register to the American, uh, it doesn't actually get addressed until it happens. But we'll get into that in a moment. So let's have a quick look at the program. Uh, the program today is for me to get out of the way as quickly as possible. For doing so, I might answer uh, three very quick questions. Firstly, yes, this is being recorded uh, and will be available in about 48 uh, hours. Secondly, uh, yes, the slides are available, such as they are. Uh, but most importantly, the third thing is how do you participate? And as we move to 435, we will be having an interactive question and answer session with the panel. And I know that's what many people out there like, and it's what we like, which is your reactions and feedback and questions. How do you do it? You go into the uh, Q&A facility here on GoToWebinar. No point in emailing us or WhatsApping us or any other of the various mechanisms. We are here with you, uh, and that's the way to put it in. Uh, further, all of the uh, questions, uh, comments, and observations that you might have with your emails attached will be sent to uh, George, Elizabeth, and Christine uh, in case you want to get in touch with them for something else or another reason. So they will get everything that you contribute uh, to be able to comment back on. Uh, what we're going to do in terms of the openings is, as ever with these, a very short uh, two-minute opening round from each of our participants, and then a more general discussion around two themes, the role of government and society and the role of politicians and officials in government, business, and finance. And then over to that Q&A, uh, followed by uh, basically some summary and a close. So I believe I'm out of the way a minute ahead of time, and I would like to turn, therefore, to our first in the opening round, Robin, uh, George C. Barnes, Deputy Director of the NSA, who is dialing in from uh, DC area. George, the floor is yours. Great. Well, it's a pleasure to be here, Mike. And uh, really, I always enjoy the City Forum events because it brings so many of us, not only from across the ocean, but across so many disciplines. And this is a key question for all of us. Uh, we wrestle with this whole thing about being disaster proof, disaster ready. Uh, I know in my own life, uh, in my organization here, part of our idea or part of our authority is to provide insights for government to use in policy formulation and response to things like disasters and war, but also from another perspective, uh, cybersecurity, which is a 
one of our two big goals. And so the two kind of feed off of each other in new and different ways. And so I'm really excited to see where this conversation goes. Uh, we have continued to have discoveries on the cyber side, so I'm sure we'll get into that, but it's not just about cyber. There are many things in our world that are causing us to change our mindset, change our persp perspective of risk, and uh, it's something we all have to learn how to tackle together. So thanks, look forward to the discussion. Fantastic, thank you, George. I'd like to turn now, if I might, to Elizabeth. Uh, Elizabeth is a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. Uh, Elizabeth, your, your opening remark. Thank you very much. Uh, like uh, a number of people, I think, uh, on the call, I'm dialing in from London. I just arrived from Washington and I'm on my way to Bristol. So uh, it's, a, it's a privilege, really, in this globalized world to be able to travel so much. Uh, but uh, uh, international travel, like, like all the essential services we depend on, is obviously hugely uh, uh, prone to disruption, uh, increasingly disruption caused by Mother Nature, but also, uh, also disruption caused by uh, hostile states and the groups that they support. And I think this is, it, I, I don't want to be too Pollyanna-ish, but it, it is almost, uh, uh, if I may say, a benefit that, that the two are meeting at this moment. Uh, 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 extreme weather events are increasing at the same time as hostile state aggression is increasing. And that means that it's clear to, I think, every single one of us that, that the, the essential services that our digital sizes depend on um, are under strain. Um, who are really, uh, or rather, are under threat from from disruption caused by whomever. It almost doesn't matter in resilience that the 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 cause of the disruption or or the the dysfunction isn't as as important as the resilience to it. And uh, this is where we have so many opportunities. I think, regardless of of ideology or political persuasion, to to. Uh, bring in uh, not just uh, all parts of the government, uh, that's so almost passe now, the talk of, of whole of government, but all parts of society, uh, including those who don't feel strongly about national security, and, and in fact think uh, they are a bit reluctant to, to even uh, entertain thoughts about the military. But when it comes to resilience, that's something that, that we can all agree is necessary. And that doesn't just involve uh, ordinary citizens, but companies as well. And if we look at the, the many recent events where uh, Russian vessels have been loitering on top of undersea cables, most recently in Ireland, what is Ireland supposed to do about that? If it's in the EEZ as it was, uh, there isn't really very much Ireland could do, even if it had a proper navy. Uh, but I think what we can do as Western societies is start involving the operators and owners of, of uh, critical national infrastructure uh, to, to have them patrol their installations more and have the governments only uh, intervene when there is a serious incident that, that it wouldn't be appropriate for, for a private entity to respond to. Over. Thank you, Elizabeth. And uh, just if I may then uh, turn to Christine. Christine, uh, you know, how does this topic strike you? Thank you. How it strikes me is that Britain is recklessly exposed to new pandemics and not just Britain. Uh, according to Dr. Clive Dix just this month. And uh, Clive is the former chair of the UK Vaccines Task Force. As you said, Michael, um, there is abundant research about the key potential risks. We've got them all flagged up there. And I would commend for anybody who really wants to look into the risks we haven't thought about, read science fiction, or read Kim Stanley Robinson, the Ministry for the Future, read Ian McEwan, Machines Like Me, and read Clara and the Sun by Kazuo Ishiguro. These things will give you ideas about what the future might actually look like. And thinking that Drew Venn predicted the hot air balloon, um, you know, you need to look quite far ahead here. So one of the things I love about City Forum is there's a strong practical streak. And so I am going to be practical. I'm going to start with an ending and I've got another ending at the end, but I've got a, a little to do list here. So I think there is a national preparedness commit, uh, commission in this country and there are others elsewhere. It should be tasked to produce implementation plans. We've got loads about theory and strategy, but actually one of the things that government and sometimes business is fundamentally bad at doing, unless in a crisis, is implementation. And the commission should be tasked to monitor progress in the way that the Com Committee on Climate Change does. 
regulators and, and insurers have a risk here. I think it's behaviour change that involves all of us and regulators and insurers can help drive that. There needs to be an alliance between government, industry, finance and science. There are select committees in the UK on just about everything you can care to name, hundreds of APPGs. There needs to be an over, overall preparedness APPG and a group cross parliamentary to drive this. So finally, behaviour needs to change as I referenced. That involves all of us and we need mechanisms to incentivise and shape change. According to McKinsey's State of the Organisation Study 2023, so quite current then, 50% of organisations say they are unprepared to anticipate and react to external shocks. Wake up everyone, we have work to do. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much for that. Great. Well, uh, it's uh, it's nice to have some of these opening remarks, and, and not least, I should probably have pointed out, uh, Christine, I do sit on the National uh, Preparedness Commission as one of the commissioners. Um, I must say, though, with a budget, with a budget of exactly zero, uh, the idea of us preparing implementation plans at the moment is very, very unlikely. Um, we are spending, I think, quite a bit of our time, though, seeing some of the dissonance between industry's decisions on this and the government's, for example, on something like the uh, Thames Barrier, where opinions differ wildly uh, uh, in business about whether or not they do or don't believe government estimates. But uh, let's move into the first of our panel discussions. So, so the theme that we uh, were picking here uh, was very much the idea of the role of government and society. And we had two sort of two sub questions. Uh, like Harry Potter, are there any defenses against the gray arts? And maybe to get things going, um, I, I'd like to read out a, a, one of our very first questions. Uh, it's from Malcolm War, and Malcolm says that the Singapore education system, CCE 2021, includes resilience as a core aim. What do we need in our schools, uh, if it's not Hogwarts, uh, to improve resilience amongst our young citizens? George, would you like to open? Certainly, I think it's a key point because all too often, most of us carry on our lives uh, really without consideration of the unfortunate realities that surround us. And you know, one of the things we find, uh, at least in our system here in the US, is uh, we need to start earlier. We have uh, children nowadays are extremely intelligent, they're connected, they're aware, and so they have the capacity to actually start understanding things of consequence. And that can help guide them and pad them into you know, their educational pursuits and, and their professions. And so I think the Singapore is, is extremely uh, proactive. Uh, we just had uh, leadership from the cyber security agency over here just two weeks ago from Singapore. They on lots of fronts are getting their um, self situated to understand not only the need for resilience, but they look at themselves as a, they're a key uh, transport hub for the world and understanding what happened when we all faced the pandemic and, and shipping stopped dead. Uh, that was a big issue for, for many of us, but for a country who's so reliant on that, it was a wake up call. And so I think instilling some of those considerations in our children is, is important. We don't want to overload it, of course, but I think to create some of the, the key principles of what is this thing called resiliency and, and what types of disasters could actually confront us in the future. All of us understand weather, weather continues to change, but it's something that is very easy to understand. There are other things that are less easy, such as medical pandemics uh, until they happen and then they become more easy and other invisible things uh, like cyber, for instance. And do you see any kind of immediate low-hanging uh, fruit, as they say in the trade, or you know, takeaway that people ought to be doing after a webinar like this? Oh, I forgot this should be top of my entry. Well, I, I think one of the things is to, to just look at what's happened in various corners of our own society and how does, it, how does it affect me or how does it affect my family or my local community? Um, unfortunately, many of these things that are happening on a global um, at a global level are coming local. And that's one of the, the dynamics that's changing uh, all too often for so long. Many big events that happened in the world were isolated and you heard about them on the news perhaps, or maybe didn't hear about them at all. 
Uh, now things are actually touching us much more broadly. Uh, everything from weather all the way to cyber, it, it's it's global. And I, and I think having people understand that is really important because right now just taking the impact of uh, the pandemic of ransomware by non-state actors that are harbored by a lot of the autocratic nations, ransomware um, actors are holding small municipalities, schools, hospitals as victims, uh, and they find themselves not only not ready, but they, they were blindsided in many respects because they couldn't even imagine that something on the other end of the earth could actually bring them to their knees. And so I think that that awareness comes all the way down in the, in the case of schools. We had last summer, the Los Angeles school system basically had to delay opening because of a ransomware event that attacked a lot of their records keeping. And so these are bringing, these dynamics are bringing things very local. And I think that's important because once things are local, they have meaning and people are more prone to engage. Elizabeth, your, your thoughts on this topic? Yeah, so first, uh, I'll just say regarding, regarding the National Preparedness Commission, it's it's a fantastic initiative set up by, by Toby Harris, Lord Harris, but it's an NGO, not a government agency, it's not even a clan go, so it has a, a limited uh, scope for what it can do, and I'm one, one of the commissioners, I, I love uh, the work we do uh, at the National Preparedness Commission, and, and Christine, following up on your suggestion, I, I, I would think that would be a way to, to make uh, the National Preparedness Commission turn it into a clan go. Obviously, it would never become a government agency, and it, it, it shouldn't, but if it, if it were to operate as a clan go on behalf of the, or uh, um, on a government mandate, I think uh, that that would be, uh, that, that could have really uh, positive uh, and substantial results. Then when it comes to education, I think the, the, the challenge we have is that, Everybody expects schools to, to teach uh, to, to teach uh, societies, children, uh, everything, starting with uh, tying their shoelaces all the way up to, to cyber defense. And schools are just not in a position to teach all these skills. And, and that means that parents have to teach uh, some of the skills. But uh, it, it's also never too late to learn. And one of the big challenges that we have when it, when it comes to to cyber resilience and indeed all kinds of resilience is that it's not just it's not just uh, the, the young people among us who are who are who lack knowledge. It's actually the rest of us as well, and we could uh, stand to learn a great deal about resilience. And I think our public libraries have a fantastic. A potential fantastic role to play in that area. They exist in every community. They are trusted by everyone, even though in the US they, they are becoming more politicized. But nevertheless, they are an institution uh, spread all over there, a, 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 a collective institution spread all over the country, staffed by professionals who could uh, learn even more to in order to teach the rest of us. And uh, the, the, that would also uh, then they could also become a forum where people come together to learn. Uh, it shouldn't just be uh, remote learning. One of the problems uh, in resilience is that if you don't, if you don't, if, if you do it on your own, then it's you, you sort of head down the path of becoming a prepper. Uh, that's not what we want. We want collective resilience. So learning together, I think, would uh, would be beneficial in all kinds of ways. And uh, Public libraries would be a good starting point. In the UK, we have the fantastic um, Duke of Edinburgh scheme, which is the best example of, of civic resilience uh, that exists anywhere. Uh, but not all of us, are, uh, I think all of us on the call may be too old to join, to join the Duke of Edinburgh scheme. So uh, there should be opportunities for, for those of us, uh, let's say, above the age of 20 as well. And I think we're all keen to learn a bit more. Then in terms of what could be done straight away, I would recommend reading the, the Swedish leaflet, If Crisis of War Comes. It's the best in the business. It came out in 2018, uh, almost to the date, and people sort of uh, ridiculed it then because it really explains what to do in a crisis, uh, in a, a non-kinetic crisis, so crisis short of war, and indeed if war comes and people will thought it was uh, totally overblown and and, uh, and paranoid, well then uh, COVID struck and then Ukraine happened. So the Swedish uh, Civil Contingencies Agency was, was right uh, on the money with this leaflet. And by the way, it, it, it is translated into English and various other languages. So that is the best place to start with over. Okay. Well, thank you. Well, uh, Christine, you, you raised science fiction and uh, you may recall a 
an old novel by Larry Niven called Ring World, in which there were these puppeteers who were so aware of risks that they froze. And, you know, we, we could over-educate and let uh, basically the fear of the past paralyze us in the future, perhaps. But uh, what are your thoughts on the role of government and society in the wider sense? Well, we could indeed be paralyzed. And, uh, but fortunately, although my, my Quidditch is on holiday at the minute, I'm sure I'd have it around to, to help me out. And uh, it would be tremendous on a Duke of Edinburgh uh, award scheme as well. So how I'm going to approach this is I'm going to use a concrete example, which is kind of close to my heart, um, and that is AI, which I prefer to call alternate intelligence. And I was privileged in my, you know, dim and distant, but Bletchley Park days after the war, guys, um, to meet some of the forefathers of AI. The fact that it's currently inorganic, um, you know, and was man-made, doesn't render it artificial and I kind of prefer alternate for that reason. So a lot of the current noise is about generative AI, but it's ubiquitous. We use it in insurance and in claims and sales, in order email and speech recognition and in ways we're not we're not conscious of 24-7. So the risks are well rehearsed thus far, confidentiality, security, transparency, inaccuracy, abuse and trust. But fundamentally, relating back to some of the things that George said, AI could be used to foment um, and operationalize global unrest on a scale and at a speed previously unknown. So the role of government here, I think, is as follows. Legislation, regulation, education, investment in the right spots, diplomacy, because, you know, like many things, it's connected and being convener in chief with a national plan. So the new EU AI regulation sets a significantly higher bar for model governance than is the case, for example, for GDPR breaches. And we need to be looking at high standards here. I also think, Michael, that insurance is a possible tool and more, as I've said before, as a mechanism for shaping risk and managing behavior, you know, to have a pooled fund in the same that the, you know, way that there is for other topics is something we should be thinking about. But people think about the invisible risks. There's also the big phys physical risks associated with AI, water, energy, air traffic control, transport, communications, finance, defense, government policy making, and long-term thinking, with cross-party plans can do a lot in this area. One issue, unfortunately, with government uh, decision-making is the somewhat the delegitimization of established institutions by mostly, but not always, right-wing populists. So there is an issue of trust between government and people here. And, you know, the mantra, the people have spoken, is really going quite out of date and shabby. Society's role, broader society, is learning about it. We've spoken about education, skilling up, not running away, actively seeking to protect human rights. And, you know, that's why I've chosen that example. I think it's really live. We're only just beginning to understand the full scope. And again, we can act together uh, to make sure that we get the best out of this rather than the worst. Wonderful. Well, it is an interesting bit that uh, we we have to, in some way, uh, open up and be accepting that these things exist and then work out how we're going to deal or implement with them. But I think in the next session, we've got a, a, a couple of questions. So as we turn to the next uh, theme, which is looking at the role of uh, politicians and officials, I think it's about tough choices. We have an interesting uh, question, a comment here from Alan Punter. The preparation and imp implementation costs money and spending now with very long term return periods, whilst individuals and governments have much shorter time horizons. How do we square this circle? Uh, and I might, in this case, uh, turn to you, Christine, first. OK, well, I'm going to start by saying it's not going to be that long term. Uh, in the case of AI, we are looking at the next five years, the next 10 years. That has to be pretty fast things are moving incredibly quickly. And I think that we'll find that with the, the use of AI, some sorts of risks and opportunities will accelerate. So it's not in the same way that there was, you know, with the 
the very well actually and I, I've used it myself in, in the College of Policing um, and Ministry of Defence option planning scenario looking 40 years out. Yes, we do need to do that, but the speed of change is such, I believe, and I'm very happy to uh, you know, have a debate about it, is faster and we need to look at shorter time frames when we can be more certain and, of course, return on investment is much more measurable. Great. Elizabeth, any thoughts from you? Just to say that uh, politicians are, are working on it, and I know from, from my own experience working with several governments, they are uh, acutely aware of the need to increase resilience. They're trying to, to find models to do it. Uh, and uh, it, it is, for, for an academic like me, it's, it's, a, it's a privilege to work with, with uh, practitioners who, uh, when you propose a solution, say, well, how would you do this? How would you do that? And then you realize that you, there were aspects, aspects you hadn't thought of, including the legal aspects. For example, uh, if you want to involve companies in, in building resilience, what are the, uh, the legal ramifications of involving some companies but not others? Does it give them an undue, the, the ones you choose to get it, uh, to, to involve, does it give them an undue commercial advantage, even though uh, there is no uh, there is no uh, uh, commercial aspect to to the, the the precise work you're undertaking with the government, but uh, all these questions are, are, are issues that that uh, have to be ironed out and are being ironed out, ironed out by by the, the pioneering governments that that. Uh, uh, are working on solutions at the moment, if, if I may highlight a few. Um, Australia, the Czech Republic, uh, Latvia, uh, and of course the perennial suite in Finland, but they already had, had a pretty good system set up during during the Cold War. And the UK, we, should, we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't uh, underestimate what the UK government is doing if we put uh, resilience at the forefront in the 2021 um, uh, integrated review and, and for example I was privileged to be part of, of some of the impl implementation of that. It's just extremely difficult if you're not going to legislate to tell everybody what to do, how can you involve them and that is the challenge we have as, as liberal democracies and, and the autocracies can just tell their companies and citizens what to do. Uh, we don't do that in our liberal democracies and yes we can legislate but that's a, that's a, a tool of last resort, it should be a tool of last resort and within resilience it is it, it, it is possible to involve uh, the private sector and, and, and the public without legislating. It's just much harder than if you were to just command them to, to be involved. Over. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, George, uh, you know, our family is addicted to all sorts of programs ranging, you know, from Korean through to American. But, uh, you, you know, if you watch The West Wing or these days, I guess it's The Diplomat or something, you're, you're reminded of a film called Everything Everywhere All at Once. And, uh, do, do politicians and officials try to do too much? Do they take responsibility to do too much? Wouldn't, it, wouldn't they be better to say, listen, you know, this is this is on the other side of the world. And I, I totally get Elizabeth's point. It might hit us, but the odds are kind of low. Are we, are we just trying to get too much done? Uh, <clears throat> I think you have a, a great point there because we can become all consumed by everything that's going to affect us, right? And so we have to, I think part of all of this gets into a broader understanding of the risks and the threats. Uh, it's really education and awareness. And so that comes from uh, transparency, communication, uh, meeting in the middle. And so it's very hard, if not impossible, to legislate uh, in our respective countries. So we have, in the United States, we have the federal government, we have state governments, we have privatized critical infrastructure. So lots of different things are pulling and pushing on each other. And so the one way to harmonize is to get a common understanding of what we're trying to deal with. And that brings people to a common uh, course with respect to what's their respective role in dealing with it. I think that's the best way we are finding um, just in the case of uh, cybersecurity penetrations and uh, activities from far afield on the other end of the world. Uh, I mentioned ransomware. Well, the DPRK cyber actors are using that to generate revenue for North Korea's weapons programs, right? And so, but they are reaching globally. Well, what does that mean? And how do we actually come together and, and have a cohesive response? Uh, it is a, a dynamic that's challenging because there are so many different things pulling on us and all of them cost a lot of money. A lot of times we find that the impact of 
any type of an issue that arises, any type of a disaster, whether it be in the virtual world or the physical world, uh, lands on uh, local governments that are ill-prepared and, and not ready to actually absorb the fiscal ramifications. And so they turn to someone else uh, and everybody turns to someone else. And so I think part of what we have to deal with is, again, understanding education, um, and really awareness. And, and we're doing that here in the US, we've been spending a, quite a bit of time trying to spread the word. I, I know we, just in the case of critical infrastructure and how it's affected by cyber threats, uh, we have mounting evidence of cyber threats from nation state actors as well as the non-nation state ones. We bring, uh, actually the White House convenes small sets, we'll bring the leaders of different sectors together and we'll give them classified briefings. We like vet them and clear them for a day and we actually impart on them, not just what we've pulled together from all the open sources, but here's the classified insight we have that really gives you an in indicator of what's happening and why it's happening and what it means to them. Uh, they really have to be able to internalize this so that they can go back into their sectors or their states or their localities and figure out, okay, now that I've been loaded with this information, what's my responsibility to act you know who do i need to influence how do i need to generate interest and that interest turns into uh revenue choices right and so i i think it all comes down to finding creative ways to engage so that people feel ownership in the answer great well thanks for all that warm-up we turn now of course to uh, some of the comments questions and observations from the audience uh, we have quite a large audience out there so if you'd like to have your comment, question, or observation uh, uh, th thrown up in the discussion, uh, please share it quickly. Um, but let's get cracking. Um, John Adams, who's a, a longstanding friend of City Forum and FS Club, uh, says that Sh Simon Sharp, in his new book, Five Times Faster, suggests uh, that we look at red teaming, which is looking at the worst possible scenarios, uh, but we could also have green teaming, looking at climate change, what climate change outcomes we want and can achieve. Uh, who is leading in this area, in your opinion? Um, Christine? Um, it's an interesting word to use. I mean, I think there is leadership um, from the government in this area. I think there is leadership from the opposition, just thinking about the UK, and the same applies in other jurisdictions as well. But the problem with it is that quite often, the lead, you know, the leadership isn't joined up with the levers to do anything. So this needs civil society to act as well. I think in the UK, the Commission on Climate Change, as the Committee on Climate Change, has done fantastic work. I mean, it is, it's all there. The problem with uh, climate change issues, which none of us can avoid, and I think all of us are aware of just how connected that is, is it creates paralysis through fear, actually. So I'm certainly extremely intelligent people I know walk away from this subject because it's too big and too scary and too existential to do anything about it. But, you know, we believe that and that's the day we might as well pack up as a species because there's plenty that can be done about it. There's investment opportunity. And I actually think that the finance industry and industry per se is a big, big part of the solution here. They just need to see the opportunities and people are already committing to making the decisions to switch investments, to put investments in renewables for, there's a huge amount going on in that sector. Concrete, which is a, you know, a bit of a hidden um, subject in some ways, but the World Concrete Association has taken it upon itself to campaign a green concrete rather than what we have at the minute with the huge release of methane. So I think industry is giving it some really great leadership. And I think those in industry who want to recruit the current and upcoming generations really had better pay attention because this subject matters to them. Hmm, interesting. Well, as a sci-fi aficionado, I certainly don't want to be packing up my bags and leaving for another planet despite, despite my reading material. Uh, George, um, yeah, th things on climate change are very different in America. It's taken a different response. And sometimes I don't actually think it's appreciated. A good example is the American boardrooms have been resisting uh, making statements that they, they, they are unable to substantiate because the fear of litigation is so high, while European boards are making all sorts of promises that 
frankly, a lot of people can't figure out how they would keep. Um, so it's not always this one-way thing that America is bad because it doesn't have a carbon market, despite having left Europe in the aisles after Kyoto in 97. But anyway, let's not go there. George, how would you look at that situation of green teaming or uh, the climate change debate from an American perspective? Yeah, I think um, one of the things that's been uh, causing a lot of anxiety here, I, I've personally been anxious about it just for our country, is the Colorado River. Okay, so the Colorado River feeds 40 million people um, and feeds, you know, it, it's the existence, not only the 40 million people at the end of that river and along it, but it's also the the the, the bread basket, you know, the, the farming that creates all the fruit and vegetables that many of them that go across the United States. So all of us are dependent on that. Um, and that's really reliant on snowpack and rainfall, which uh, we've been under a series of uh, multi-year um, droughts in the West. As you all know, if you haven't been there, you've heard about the fires, you've heard about all, all manner of climactic uh, activity. But watching the the reality of the Colorado River and the, the various um, reservoirs drying up has been a, a point of interest just because finally a little teeny stepping stone happened just a few months ago where some of the states along that river actually got together and created uh, mechanisms to reduce the amount of water that they would take. Um, and that's a big deal because so many states are along the river. Getting a bunch of states actually to agree on anything is a big deal, but something that is existential as, as existential as, as access to water is a big, big deal. And so I think that comes from a shared awareness of a disaster that's looming. Um, and, and you can see the rate of change in that case, you can see the, uh, the lake beds, uh, the water levels going down year on year and an anxiety of not being ready and how long it would take to get ready if those reservoirs did dry up. And so I, I think again, having something that that was uh, much more existential than other things that are slower which is a problem you know carbon buildup um in the atmosphere has been one that we've all wrestled with right but uh but i but i, I was heartened to see how these states did get together for um agreements on on water and so it these are things that are we're all coming into the the reality that we have to grapple with our environment and the rate of a change and, and its impact on all of us. Okay. Um, we've got a, a question here from you, Percy, that I might throw to you, Elizabeth. Uh, he says that the threats to supply chain security, for example, seem to be driving national protectionist policies at a rapid rate. Is this happening at the expense of international collaboration on managing and mitigating broader global risks? Uh, well, uh, it's, uh, I'm delighted to take this question because I, I just submitted uh, my, my new book on, on globalization and geopolitics and the, it is in fact exactly what's happening. We are seeing uh, clearly the division, increasingly clearly, uh, acceleratingly clearly the division of the world into two blocks and not military blocks this time, but, but uh, trading blocks and not formal blocks where you sign on the dotted line, but informal ones. And so we are returning, in a sense, to the, the Cold War uh, arrangement, uh, trading arrangement in the world, where, where essentially the world was a, a string of islands, and, and each island was, was more or less, uh, well, it was actually self-sufficient, and the island could be a large uh, one, like, uh, like the, the European community, uh, or it could be a small one, like one of the Latin American countries that, that were practicing uh, protectionist policies. But the point is that we are returning to that, uh, but with, with two, essentially two large islands this time. And the question is, for, for companies, and for governments um, here in the West and, and, and uh, elsewhere as well. The, the question is, what do we do? What should companies do that operate now let's, uh, on, on, the, on the equivalent of behind the Iron Curtain, companies that operate in, in countries that are, are geopolitical adversaries? And can they, uh, are there ways in which they can make themselves safe enough 
to keep uh, operating there, even maybe with with, uh, with less exposure. But can they have any operations there, or is 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 it too risky? And this is obviously what, what politicians are, are struggling with at the moment. They are trying to, to encourage companies to to stay in China and not pull out completely, because if they did, uh, our GDP would in, in every Western country would would clearly plummet. But at the other hand, on the other hand, uh, operating in China and, and, and a few other countries bring risk of retaliation against uh, any company as soon as as the home government that company's home government does something that the chinese government or the russian government or whoever the government happens to be uh, that they disagree with and this is so different from the cold war where our companies just didn't have that exposure they were essentially just in, in countries that were uh, geo geopolitically uh, aligned with the west and uh, i would not want to be a ceo today but um uh, still, it's, it's a privilege to be part of, of, of uh, the discussions and hear them, but I wouldn't want to be the person making the making the decision to pull out or stay, considering what, what the stakes are. Over. Thank you. I, Michael, if I may just uh, pop in there, because I think that there is, that is really interesting, uh, but I think it's nuanced as well. If you consider the example of Ukraine, where I'd argue in some senses, collaboration, cooperation of necessity has been driven. Who would have honestly known before the war that Ukraine was the, you know, the, the breadbasket of the world to the extent that it is? And now it's on everybody's, everybody's radar. And it kind of takes me into my next topic, which I will refrain from temptation. Um, but I think that kind of incident shows that there can be better global uh, collaboration, that companies can work together, that we can solve problems. Part of the issue is it all has to be driven by a crisis, which is a great focus point. If we could just take the attitude that, you know, we know what these are going to be, let's predict the most likely ones, let's prepare as best we can. And I don't think it's simply about let's try and prepare for every possible scenario, it's let's help our citizens and our governments be in a state of preparedness where they are constantly learning so that we can deal with these things better because there'll be things that we haven't thought out about without a question of a doubt. George, your thoughts on this? George, you're on mute there, sorry. We developed a fully globalized world, and and now we're like in the state of buyer's remorse, and we're and we're stuck between two things. And so I think the reality is we cannot shrivel back into our our, our nest and 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 be isolationist. We have to find ways to actually push through, and that's going to take a combination of governments working together, um, industries working together, and then you know we do have to figure out how to create accountability for bad behavior. And so that's that's hard. And I know a lot of countries right now feel like they're in a tussle caught between like a US-China um, situation. And, and we end up working with a lot of countries around Europe, around the Far East. Uh, just look at the, the microelectronics situation. We have uh, fabs that are highly reliant on markets in China whether they have fabs in, of course, Taiwan, but also Korea, uh, those countries are very anxious about getting taught and in, caught into a situation where they have to choose. And so I think we all have to be eyes wide open and, and understand that all of us are dependent on China. Uh, we will, we've, we've purposely created that dynamic. Um, I think as what we learned, not just from the geopolitical perspective, but from the pandemic is that we can't have a just-in-time supply chain that's totally global because there are real ramifications when things stop you know and so we learned that in the just-in-time delivery of goods and services from china when all of our ports got choked down because we didn't have workers that were able to access them and so i think redistribution of functions more thoughtfully to reconcile disaster proofing, geopolitics, and then what's happening with respect to uh, those different industries. I think all those have to kind of come together and in new, new and different ways. When we globalize towards China, I know in the US we went for the price point, cheap manufacturing, great uh, 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 high tech in China. It was all about the price point and we weren't thinking about resiliency. 
Well, now we think about resiliency from the standpoint of global health situations as well as geopolitical, right? And money, and then you know, putting pressure on countries that are acting badly, such as Russia. So those are other variables that now have come into equations. And, and I think looking forward, we're gonna to have to balance all of those together. Yeah, so to me, it's interesting on how you balance these things. Uh, one of the, uh, when you solve for a single variable like efficiency or low cost, you create a brittle system. But you have to accept that a highly competitive environment where, say, cost is the dominant factor, that brittleness will arise. You need to find ways to push back. We have traditionally used risk reward analysis, real option theory, to value what is the option, for example, of having a second or a third supply chain and how much is that worth to you. But it doesn't make it to the front line as much as it should. And some of these techniques are, let's be honest, somewhat esoteric. What approaches do you use to encourage putting resilience back into things? I mean, I know, oh, go ahead, uh, Elizabeth. I was just going to say that it's, uh, it's a market advantage or a competitive advantage for companies uh, in a way that it wasn't three or four years ago, simply because now the global public and in, in particular the Western public is so uh, aware of, of uh, threats and risks uh, in, in, in global manufacturing and the global supply chains. And so uh, if, if a company can uh, demonstrate um, uh, and, and essentially tell its shareholders, prospective shareholders, customers, prospective customers, uh, yes, we are aware of the threats and risks, and uh, yes, we are exposed to them, but here are the measures we have put in place to block the impact of, the, of those risks. That would be a massive competitive advantage, and there is a very good example of a company that has done it uh, to great success, with great success, and that, that is Mask. Uh, uh, as uh, everybody knows, Mask was, was brought down by the Norpetia virus uh, six years ago but and, and, and it was it was devastating but since then um, well first of all they went public with it at the time and since then they've been talking about it uh, a lot including the chairman who has been talking about it a lot and essentially making the point yes this happened to uh, to us there is no point hiding it but we have put fantastic protection in place in sense they've uh, they've really turned lemons into lemonade and that is i think a really good example that other uh, other companies could, could learn from george and then christine george now, I, I was just going to pile on to what she was saying about uh, understanding value. It's it's different than it was, you know, cost and value are taking on a different proportion, different meaning. And so I think, you know, we we went towards cheap uh, and we didn't have all the other considerations. And I think one of the things that we we forget when we get very focused on the the immediate change in the cost of goods and services going up because we can't fully take advantage of cheap markets in a place that's problematic. You know, we are the, we in our countries are the seed corn of new ideas, products and services and the freedom that people have to turn ideas into realities and in, into wealth and value for a customer base is something that the autocratic societies struggle with um, understandably. And so I think ultimately that will differentiate us as long as we hold on to these ideals that have created the environment for new things to become valuable and that will propel us right and so yes the cost of things will go up a bit you know i think that's the equalization of the world we're not going to be in a situation where we just go for cheap labor no matter what the cost is to the people developing the goods uh you know we're trying to have kind of set our standards for human rights um and those types of things is important but you know, I watched the dynamics of um, the the enterprises in China who were reacting against the to you know the controls that the state has over them. Uh, that really eats into innovation, and that kind of curbs their ability to do what they would otherwise have been able to do. Really, before she came into power in you know 2013 or so, and kind of changed the trajectory of that country. And so I so I think. We're at a point of change there, and I think taking the longer view, I think our system will still win out. 
And hopefully it'll it'll take hold in some of those other countries and they'll realize, as some have in the last couple of years, um, they do not want to have control and oppression to force the development of new capability. Christine? A very briefly, resiliency indices and getting the ratings agencies to take a real interest in this, that will change behavior. That's, a, that's a, an excellent suggestion indeed. Uh, Elizabeth? Uh, yeah, just following up on what Christine said, uh, Standard & Poor just put out an excellent report on exactly that, that they will monitor, uh, well, they, they're not saying they will monitor, but that they, was, they said that uh, companies' preparedness for cyber attacks um, it's, it's, it's a point that, that should be looked at. So essentially, the, what, what, uh, what they are suggesting is that ratings agencies should take that into account. And, and, uh, and as you say, Christine, that, that, is, uh, that is not just uh, uh, desirable, it's, it's probably inevitable. Well, I'll put into the uh, chat room in a moment a report from Saracen about 10 years ago where they actually did take into account the environmental impact on government bond quality, which I thought was was very interesting. And so I think that's a good point, Christine. Indeed. Now, look, um, you know, I I uh, I hear all of this, and I think it's great. But I, when I see consumers, real consumers, making choices, price is everything. And so the idea that they're going to, you know, pay, you know, for 60 years uh, for somebody to have dual supply chains more until the event occurs and they manage to get the same source. I'm afraid I, I don't buy that fully. And I, I think Nadine Rose is also there. Um, Richard Sage um, says, uh, Christine, I suggest your answer about long-term itself displayed the gulf that does exist between business and bureaucracy. Uh, five years is not short-term for business, it's an eternity. And yet it's, you know, clearly where policymakers and thinkers like ourselves tend to sit. Um, so we do have th this split here, but let's turn to Nadine. Now Nadine says, a conversation I had today with a contact in Kenya who works with smallholder farmers selling into European and American value chains, a uh, conversation was explaining how difficult it is for farmers to understand the wider, wider geopolitical climate change impacts uh, being the reason for the reduction in price or demand for their produce decreasing in price or demand, for example, during COVID. Now, do you have any ideas as to how these people who are already living on low incomes can be taught how to build resilience into their lives. And while you're just pondering that, I point out that, you know, we in the West can't get people to save for their retirement. Uh, so, so here we are lecturing smallholders living on the edge of subsistence that they ought to be taking a longer term geopolitical view. So uh, Christine, perhaps I'll turn to you on that one. How, do you have any ideas on how we can help them build resilience into their lives? Uh yeah, in one sense, I think we need to flip the table, really, because as you as you just said, we're lecturing. That is the problem. These communities and indigenous communities are going to be crucial in helping us solve the issues of climate change. We sit here on our little islands, peninsulas, or whatever else it is, the land mass, and think, oh, we've got a problem with migration, or some people think we have a problem with migration. It is nothing compared to the global movements that there will be when climate change really, really kicks in. So we need to work with these people and resource them and not think that it's a false economy to do so. And we need to listen because there's a lot that we can learn from indigenous communities about how to look at the assets uh, that, they, that they occupy. So I would change the nature of the debate, Michael. Thank you. Elizabeth? Um, I don't uh, have a, a, great, a great deal to, to add on that point, but it, it just highlights uh, the need for, for the COP uh, conferences to succeed. And uh, if you look at, for example, some countries are extremely ambitious, Germany, uh, they, you can only applaud them for their, for their green policies, but um, I'm not telling you, I'm not telling your, your listeners or your participants anything new if, uh, by saying that it's, uh, it, it's, uh, if it's just uh, uh, individual Western governments that, that try to solve climate change, <laughs> clearly we will fail as, as, as a global community. Mm -hmm. uh, George? Um, <clears throat> I don't really have anything to add on that. Uh, no, that's good. I'm, 
Sorry, I don't have much many ideas on top of that. No, nope, that's great. Well, I'm going to turn to one final uh, comment. Uh, it's a little bit of a downer, so uh, I'll turn to you in, in a few moments as well for your closing remarks. So maybe we can all be a bit more upbeat. But um, C Clive Bullen is here, and he's just wondering: uh, in the UK and the USA, isn't the government system bust, focused on politicians rather than their citizens? Um, and before I do, I mean, George, you talked about our, our our system, you know, ultimately winning out, so to speak. Uh, would you accept the uh, Clive's premise that this is really kind of a busted flush? I think if you watch our news, you would think we're totally focused on politicians, um, and I agree. <laughs> uh, but if you look in reality, and I'll just take you know my my space where I operate, um, the amount of information that the that the pieces of the U.S. government are putting out there to guide partnerships with industry that are new and different that didn't happen five years ago, uh, information and guidance with respect to cybersecurity standards, practices, guidelines. Uh, we are jointly working with industry to eliminate threats to people, whether that's be in their private lives, in their corporate lives, in their municipalities. And so I think just go onto our website, NSA.gov, and look at all the, the documents that have been jointly issued by not just NSA with its other American cybersecurity agencies, but we're very international. So all the five eyes, we're, we're putting these things out and we're actually doing it with other nations, trying to get the word out so that broader humanity can take advantage. And yes, the bad guys are reading it too, but it's worth our while to put the guidance out there because we're trying to enhance people's resiliency, survivability, and their ways of life. And so I think that's goodness. Uh, government is finding a way to work with industry and academia for good value. Uh, and that's totally apolitical. And, you know, so I, I wanna focus the energy on the good stuff, notwithstanding the fact that politics has crept into too many areas. Okay. Well, um, I'm afraid we, uh, we've kind of come to the uh, the end of time as I ask each of you to sum up. I, I, I would point out just a really quick comment from Richard Priest, where he, he believes that we should be encouraging people to adopt more systems thinking, uh, perhaps as part of civics lessons starting in school, in particular to incentives, businesses and organizations uh, to think of the externalities they create. You know, so um, I can get that. And I think to some degree, it, it is your worldview that dictates how you how you how you look at these things and if your worldview is you know what's on the shelf in front of you or uh, something you're scrabbling in the dust to raise uh, this this season that's one thing uh, and if you've got that longer term view that we would like to encourage uh, you can paralyze yourself and it's as ever in life it's a balance but if i could turn i've asked uh, everybody uh, to to make a sort of a 60 second closing remark if they wouldn't mind and i did warn the uh, warn the panelists uh, christine you're first as you know so over to you Thank you. Great point about systems. I like it. That's very sensible. I think there's much of a practical nature that can be done to mitigate against infrastructure risks. Take phosphorus. It's a vital nutrient. It's part of us. There's a finite world supply. Most of it's in Morocco. Too much of it is being washed or allowed to be washed into rivers. You mentioned Colorado uh, by water companies. Uh, too much of it is being thrown away, a third in the food waste that we still do. So, in essence, we can do something about animal feeding. There's a business opportunity in recovering the phosphorus. There's a government agency in order to force water companies to adopt the right kind of practices. And finally, as individuals, we also have personal choices in the, in the food that we buy even within the price bands that we can afford. So if we spend as much time effectively operationalizing, reviewing, learning from lessons and applying them as we did in media sound bites, we might get closer to seeing some results. <laughs> like you said at the beginning, ending at the end. So <laughs> Elizabeth Shaw, over to you. I'll give you a 10 minute uh, pitch, which is a uh, 10 second rather, 10 second, um, uh, which is that companies are a, a massive potential in, in, in national resilience because it's in their interest to be more resilient. And 
Um, and it's also uh, something that you can, can communicate to the, 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 the to anybody who's, who's who they are communicating with. I remember when ESG was not a thing for companies, then companies discovered that it could become they could use it as a competitive advantage, or that rather their efforts in ESG as a competitive advantage. I think resilience is a new ESG, and and it's something that governments should try to capitalize on this this realization and efforts by companies to 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 become more resilient over okay. very interesting point to end on and george a final word is yours i think okay um we're all interconnected uh, we face grand challenges on a global scale and it really comes through awareness education uh transparency and um trust that we all have to work together whether we're government industry the user base, uh, all of us have a role. All of us need to combine our efforts to get to joint outcomes. And, and I think we can do it. It's not forced like autocracies are. Uh, it comes out of generating value through insight and connectedness. So thanks for being with us today. I really enjoyed being part of the conversation. Well, you've been a delightful panel. Uh, I've got lots of comments and questions to send to you. And we'd like to thank the audience as well for their participation. I would say in closing, in a changing world, needing solutions to some of these big problems, it's actually our knowledge connections that will overcome the challenges. And I think that's one of the great things about this City Forum series is the connections it makes. Uh, and I often point out, you know, Macaulay said, on what principle is it that with nothing but improvement behind us, we are to expect nothing but deterioration before us? And I sometimes summarize this as, let's be optimistic, pessimism is for better times. So join us again on the City Forum Resilience thing, and uh, it's been really great to have everybody here. And thank you very much for your contributions.